seem to, these <coughs> things work. Did adjust back, stopped failing, and so on. I would, there's not a place to go into a long history on the ready taking towards time. Well, one of these events occurred in the, uh, I guess, the early 80s. It was Latin American debt crisis. We've had one, you know, the present crisis is the worst one we've had since the Great Depression. But it's not as though we haven't had others. It was the Latin American debt crisis, which affected American banks who were heavily, like Citicorp, <laughs> were heavily invested in it. And this is what got John Reed excited that he wasn't getting anything out of his economists. Um, the, uh, uh, he wanted to start in economics. The, the, the already now physicists, now in a way the idea of the self equilibrating mechanism is derived by imitation from physics. It's not that physics had a different philosophy. It was mechanics, it was the solar system, uh, to take one example, it was this marvelous uh, self, uh, system in which everything is in equilibrium, the forces from the sun, attraction of the sun and the velocities of the planets, and all, which are all in this kind of nice equilibrium. And uh, similar things apply to mechanical systems. And even statistical mechanics had, still was self-regulating, although it did introduce some new ideas. Um, it was really a physics began to find, however, there were problems that weren't met this way. Free body problems, spin glasses, or also, I, I, I learned a lot from Phil Anderson. <laughs> I'm not sure you would think I did very well, but uh, I didn't, didn't listen to him. Um, so, uh, in a way, it was a shift in that physics had met new problems, which he did. Economics. I, just let me uh, give you a personal digression. There's one part of my, I didn't mention you by my biography. Namely, I was in military service in World War II. And what was I? I was a weather man. So here I was coming from graduate student in economics, plucked out of this and becoming a weather officer. Um, and I thought, oh, well, you know, I'm really going to learn some real physics, real science, and not this sort of half-baked stuff I've been working with. Well, you try to forecast. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, mean, I, I don't think I need to elaborate. In fact, my job, but the main job I had during the whole world was to try to improve long range forecasts. By long range, you meant two to three weeks. And I'll tell you, it, was the, it, we did, it didn't. It, it, I, I was just one approach, which I think was better than any other, but it was no good. <laughs> the fact is, you couldn't forecast then more than three days ahead in, in, in a serious way. That's it, that better than very mechanical criteria. Um, now I think it's up to five to six days. And that's mainly because the data are much better. Partly it's the computer. You know, we did have models which you couldn't do anything with because there was there were, uh, beyond computing power. But it was also true that we collect a lot more data today than we did then. And between the two of them, we've got this from three days to six days. <laughs> okay. So my, I was not overly impressed with the idea that merely because something was physics, <laughs> it was automatically better than economics. Well, John Reed was a, got, I don't know the connection, how George Cowan got in touch with John Reed, but somehow the connection was made. And uh, uh, the, uh, the, and they called, when I, when I come down to attend a discussion where the physicists and economists would get to talk together. Well, we, you know, I heard a lot about simulated annealing and things like that, which I never did quite understand how they connected. But I did get this idea that they were beginning to work on the idea that if you take a network, People, can, things connect to each other, the subject of automata is the phrase that's usually used. That the, um, uh, you start something somewhere, and you have some reactions, either you develop antagonisms, or you develop positive associations, and this ripples through, and you find out yourself in totally surprising results. Things break apart, things join together, you get chaotic behavior, which of course had already been observed in weather forecasting, as a matter of fact, the revival, well, the chaos theories, actually goes back quite a way to Henri Poincaré, at least maybe earlier. The, uh, uh, the, there was a revival because people were trying to use pure, you know, mat simple, very simple models of the atmosphere for long-range forecasting. And Lorenz uh, ran the thing for three weeks, and then somebody decided, well, I better run it again just to make sure the computers are running right. Entirely different results. <laughs> you couldn't imagine how many, how could it be? It turns out he had made one digit error in the, at the end of the initial conditions were put in slightly differently than the error was made. And that little error, that's where this butterfly, famous butterfly is that, that uh, typhoons comes from. Um, well, okay, so we, and, and we, now, I can't say we've got a completed system. There are a lot of ways complex system theory goes. 
is talk about uh, general properties of complex systems. Somehow power laws tend to emerge out of complex systems. And we're a lot more respectful about power laws than, than, than we used to be. Uh, we, know, we have learned about the, the possibilities of computer simulation. Economists that tend to look down upon that. I think we've learned a great deal in that respect. However, John, John Reed was worried the Latin American death crisis. There we had the SNL crisis. If some of you may be old enough to remember that, at least. <laughs> we have the death cotton bubble. And now, of course, we have the biggest of all, you see, the, uh, of this, and where the things like leveraging in that, which are ways which are not in the ordinary. Leveraging is not really in the standard economic model, although it's a, certainly an obvious fact of the economy. And bringing that in turns out to show that these feedback mechanisms we think of as damping uh, can be explosive instead. Well, okay, with this, I think uh, I've indicated why I think the SFI program has got so much of value. The, the payoff period is going to be long. It's a lot of work, you know. Thank you. or reintroduce Raisa D'Souza, who's um, going to talk uh, a bit more and in a bit more technical detail about the networks that you've heard us uh, both mention thus far. Raisa, welcome. Thank you. So I am going to talk to you about networks and complex systems, and um, I'll tell you a little bit about my connections too. So I did do my PhD at MIT, and I did some interdisciplinary work, and I've always been very interested in complex systems. So you can see what happens to people who are sort of interested in many things. I have all my training in statistical physics and computer science, and I'm faculty in mechanical engineering, and only last year I became also faculty in computer science. And I publish pretty broadly in different journals, uh, different fields, and I'm also, as Chris mentioned, uh, external faculty at the Santa Fe Institute. But my connection to Santa Fe goes back a long time, about 15 years now. So when I was a PhD student, I went to the summer school at Santa Fe, and I've been visiting there ever since. So uh, a lot of the thoughts that I have are shaped by my involvement with SFI. So we work on complex systems. What are complex systems? Well, they're typically characterized, they're, what are complex systems? There's always the famous quote that it's like pornography, you can't define it, but you know it when you see it. <laughs> so that's what people always say about complex systems because you ask 10 different researchers and they'll give you 10 different definitions. But one thing that we tend to see in complex systems is that there are many length scales in the system and there are many time scales in the systems. Uh, we see a lot of irregular patterns of connectivity between the, the elements making up the system. And a lot of times this can be described by networks, and that's the main area of my research, so that's what my presentation will focus on. But the most interesting thing is that when we see these collections of simple elements come together in irregular ways with multiple length and time scales, we see a lot of emergent behaviors that we never would have predicted, like an e economy forming from a collection of individuals. Right? If I'm just an isolated person, I can't do anything very interesting. But once we start trading and interacting with each other, we can make these very complicated systems that head up a lot of behaviors that we never would have anticipated. So this idea of emergence, in some ways, really defines complex systems that we see more than we ever would have predicted. And it did start a lot with statistical physics where we would see collections of atoms come together and have behavior that individual atoms can't, that we would characterize as phase transitions, like the emergence of magnetization or emergence of superconductivity, which we're learning a bit more about, but we still don't fully understand phase transitions and emergence. So to me, this is really what defines complex systems, is that we see these collection of simple elements come together, self-organize, make patterns, and also we see a lot of these emergent behaviors like phase transitions that are very difficult to predict. So I told you I'd tell you a little bit about my journey. So I kind of started here at MIT, 
And I was really interested in statistical physics, but I was also really interested in computing and information and nonlinear dynamics. So I ended up um, be having a technical degree in, in uh, course eight, but I spent most of my time over in the lab for computer science, as it was called the, back in those days. So now it's CSAIL, and they have this fancy Frank Geary building. But back then, we were in Tech Square. So I had two offices, and I would go back and forth between physics and CS. And actually, I spent most of my time in CS, because they were a little bit more exciting than the physics of the <laughs> And this is still my career path. I still have multiple offices. I'm still constantly going back and forth between a lot of different departments. So I think that's what happens. So I was very interested in thermodynamics and how you could think about information, transfer information capacity as a form of thermodynamics. So that was a lot of my thesis. And then I went and I did a postdoc at Bell Labs. Bell Laboratories, the phone company. So I really started getting interested in how these ideas of self-organization and thermodynamics could relate to networks. And then I went and did a postdoc at Microsoft Research. So I worked there for a few years and started, again, thinking a lot more about networks, information flows, and um, things like web search. And now that I'm an engineer, I start thinking about how these ideas might apply to, to real engineered systems. And I might tell you a little bit about that. So, um, so we all are familiar with networks, and in my mind, we're getting more and more uh, immersed in networks constantly. So I'm going to show you a few different networks and where they're happening in different realms. And one of the things that I've been focused on, together with many of my colleagues at Santa Fe, is coming up with mathematical representations of networks and trying to think about how these fundamental objects, their structure, and their function interact with each other. So this is an example of a social network. So networks are interesting because they're made of discrete entities, nodes, that interact with other discrete entities. So um, here in the uh, right-hand side is a picture of a social network. So each node is an individual, and an edge means they have some relationship. This was actually sampled from uh, high school students and their dating patterns. So the pink nodes are girls, and the blue nodes are boys, and an edge means that they interacted. Uh, and this was the largest component that was found in this network. So there were a lot of isolated pairs, or lots of isolated nodes that didn't interact with anyone. So this was sort of like the cool, like I guess you would say. Um, and then over here on the uh, left-hand side is sort of a similar picture of else. So this is something commissioned as a for disease control, and was looking at the um, activities of pirates and people who are at high risk for HIV. So they're looking at people who are so this has been one of the starting points is to think about how the structure influences the spread of processes and after the uh, immunologists started thinking about this a lot so did the viral marketers so they want to sort of know who's the main node to influence in order to have everyone adopt a new technology um, here's another network, the internet. And here, uh, this is a picture that was made about 15 years ago. So um, it's messier now. So we would have little chance of understanding anything. And you can't really see the nodes, but here each individual node is a router, and the edges are the actual fiber connecting these routers. And the colors correspond to the country that the router is located in. And of course, we're really interested in having sample topologies of the internet. We want to understand it at a more theoretical level. We can't test new protocols on the actual internet. We need models of the internet in which to do this. We want to understand how it's growing, how to provision for the future. So modeling the internet has been a really important and um, very active area. As opposed to the internet, we know that the World Wide Web is an application layer that lives on top of the internet. Right? So the World Wide Web is a collection of HTML pages that are cached in computers in different places of the world. When I want to call up a web page, I send a, re a request, and then that request gets transferred on that physical internet of routers and cables. Right? So the World Wide Web is a virtual network that lives on top of the internet. And here, uh, each node is a web page. 